Hi. It's good to be out here again, huh? Yeah. Especially when it's not uh, over 100 degrees. God is good. We are going to be in Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. We will actually begin in verse 22 and we'll continue to chapter four, verse one. But will you pray with me before we begin? One more time. Lord, we thank you so much for being here with us. Lord, with all that's going on in this world, Lord, we know that we could count on you, that you will never leave us nor forsake us. We thank you for the strength and the power of your word. And we pray that you would do an awesome work in our hearts today as we seek you first, Lord. We honor you and we glorify you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm just getting my mic. Sit right. Okay, we are in the section of this epistle where Paul is talking about the transformed life in Jesus. And this is the truth for all Christians. Jesus is transforming our lives. Are we perfected once we accept Jesus as Lord and Savior? No, no. You're looking at me and you're like, definitely not. But something happens when we do receive Jesus. Our appetite does change. Our desires do change. We learned earlier in this chapter that we died to the old life and we were made alive in Christ. Instead of desiring only to live for ourselves, now we have a heart that seeks to honor God. And with this new desire, we learned that God has given us everything that we need, not only to want to live a transformed life, but everything we need to actually do it. He strengthens us to put off the old, dreadful, stinky clothes of sin and put on the new clothes that represent Christ. We saw that the old attire in verse five through nine of this chapter, that's sexual immorality, uncleanness, evil desires, coveting. But not only that, anger, malice, slander, even filthy language and lying are to be put out of our lives. And we are to put on the new. And we saw that in verses 12 through 14, which are tender mercies, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience. We bear with each other. We are quick to forgive and we love one another. And Paul explains that that these transforming actions and behaviors that take place should not only happen in the church, but they should extend into everyday life. In verse 18 and 19, Paul said they should be seen in our marriages and the roles God established for husbands and wives. In verse 20 and 21, Paul moved into the families, talking to both children and parents, specifically to fathers. And now from verses 22 of chapter three to to chapter four, verse one, Paul explains what the transformed life looks like in society. And that is mainly in our place of employment, the workplace, that we are to take Jesus with us to work and behave in a way that honors him at our jobs. And you might be thinking, what? I'm supposed to bring all these new life actions and behaviors to work too? We might be like, oh man, that is the one place I like to participate in foul language and crude jokes. Are you saying I need to stop that? Yeah. Does that mean I'm supposed to stop using the company's time to work on my personal tasks and just focus on the work I was hired to do? Yes. But what if I don't even like my job? Do I still need to work hard? You still need to work hard. What if my boss is kind of a jerk? Even then, what if he's not just kind of, what if he's a real big jerk? Yeah. You know, as Christians, we should be the hardest workers and the greatest examples, even in the toughest work environments, because we are representing Christ. And as we will see, we are not just representing Christ, we are doing it for Christ. And because of this, we as Christians should be the best, most diligent and loyal employees on the planet because we are doing it unto the Lord. And this will be the focus of our application this morning. The difficulty is that this all has to do within the context of slavery under the Roman Empire. And we will detail each verse as we go, but first take a glance at verse 22. It says, bond servants or slaves, obey in all things your masters. And then look down at chapter four, verse one. Paul writes, masters, give your bond servants what is just and fair. And though it is hard for us as we read these verses about slaves and masters to directly apply it to our work experience today, 
I believe we can clearly see the application for what God has for us in the workplace. But before we move into the application, I think we need to address a few things regarding slavery, namely what was taking place here at this time. And slavery is a a tough subject to talk about because of the brutality and the unfairness people have gone through as a result of wickedness, the wickedness of men's hearts. And it's really hard, especially with our own history here in America, specifically the way black people were mistreated and oppressed. It was horrible and we see the residual effects of it even today. And I feel it needs to be said that God is not okay at all with this cruel oppression of slavery. And Christianity does not teach that that's okay. You know, it's such a gross misrepresentation to believe that God approves of such brutality. I will say that God did deal with the enemy countries of Israel fiercely, even wiping some of them out completely. But the individual treatments of harsh oppression upon people does not represent God's heart. From the very beginning in the book of Genesis, we are told that all people are created in the image of God, all people. And it is wrong and shameful for anyone to think of any group of people as anything less than the image bearer of God based on their ethnicity, what they look like or where they are from. And maybe you, you know your Bible, maybe you're one who knows your Bible, and you argue, well, God allowed Israel to have slaves in the Old Testament. And that is true. But if you look at what God allowed, it is quite different than the existence of slavery in this country and the cruelty of it. In Exodus 21, to Israel, God says, he says this, anyone who kidnaps someone is to be put to death, whether the victim has been sold or is still in the kidnapper's possession. And then a few verses later, God says, and if a man beats his male or female servant with a rod so that he dies under his hand, he shall surely be punished. See, the master was not able to do whatever he wants and get away with it. God gave the servants, he gave the slaves rights. And they, if they were abused or mistreated, God even commanded them to be set free. Listen to to this in the same chapter of those other verses. It says, if a man strikes the eye of his male or female servant and destroys it, he shall let him go free for the sake of his eye. And if he knocks out the tooth of his male or female servant, he shall let him go free for the sake of his tooth. So the oppressive, inhumane treatment of others was not something that God accepted. And I think it's also important to note that one reason people in Israel became slaves was because they found themselves in difficult times financially. You see, they could not run over to Wells Fargo and get a loan. They could not stack up debt on a credit card. No, what they would do in order to take care of their family to get them food and shelter was they would offer themselves and become a slave, or like we see here in verse 22, a bond servant. But another thing that showed God's heart for people was that one of these Jewish bond servants only was required to serve his master for six years. And in the seventh year, they were to be set free and no longer indebted to their master unless the servant willingly chose to stay there. But if a slave wanted to be free after that time, listen to what God said needed to be given to the servant at their time of freedom. In Deuteronomy 15, it says this, and when you send send him away, free from you. You shall not let him go away empty handed. You shall supply him liberally from your flock, from your threshing floor, and from your wine press. From what the Lord has blessed you with, you shall give to him. The master would give the servant money, property, and animals as they were set free. This is what God says about slavery and bond servants. It's very different than the American experience of slavery. The other thing I would like to point out is slavery in New Testament Rome was far different than what we think of as well. It is believed that there were 60 million slaves in the Roman Empire. Roughly half of all people were slaves. Many Christians were slaves too. And even though there was ugly and brutal oppression taking place in some areas, many slaves were employed in different industries, farming and manufacturing, even law and politics. Scholars believe the biblical writer Luke, who was a doctor, was also a slave. And though this is so difficult to say with our history, 
slavery in Rome at this time was accepted, was an accepted part of everyday life. And this is the main reason we see the writers of the Bible not address ending slavery because it was just not possible at that time. They had no right to vote for changes to take place. They could not rise up and rebel against it. If they tried, they would be unsuccessful. It would be an instant death by the Roman forces. Paul knew then, like we know today, that in order for a society to change, it it has to be the heart change in people. Having said that, I am thankful that we do have an example of Paul pleading for that very action with a master and a slave in the Bible. It's in the book of Philemon, where a slave named Onesimus ran away from his master, Philemon. And Paul, knowing Philemon, he gives instruction to him that upon Onesimus' return to him, which he was sending him back, instead of Philemon implementing a punishment for running away, Paul writes this to Philemon. He says, perhaps the reason he was separated from you for a little while was that you might have him back forever. But he says this, no longer as a slave, but better than a slave, as a dear brother. He is a very dear, he's very dear to me, but even dearer to you, both as a fellow man and as a brother in the Lord. Paul pleads for Philemon to look at Onesimus as more than a servant, but a brother. And it seems that if you read through Philemon in this short letter, he might actually be encouraging Philemon to let Onesimus have his freedom. This is an example of a call for a radical heart transformation, which only God can do. But what Christianity, what the gospel, what Jesus does is he transforms people. Even in the midst of an unfair and ungodly society, Jesus changes hearts. He's done it throughout the history of the world and he's doing it today. He joins people together from all different walks of life, all backgrounds, all earthly experiences. And he says, you are brothers and sisters. You are united in me and you are united together. You know, with all the division, all the hate, all the animosity that we even see in this world today, I love that God has made us a family that he breaks down all that separates us and joins us together in him. You know, the church is the most beautiful creation in this world. You look around and there's some beautiful creation out there. The tropical beaches, the crystal clear oceans, the glorious snow covered mountains, the brilliant sunsets and the vast galaxies. Those are gorgeous, but God's most beautiful creation is the body of Christ. And it's not just us existing. It's not just the body of Christ being here but us truly being there for one another, bearing with, listening to, caring and loving each other as one family. All cultures, rich, poor, old, young, healthy, sick. What God has called us to be is beautiful. And we need to realize it. And we need to participate in it. And we need to shine to all who are looking on so that they could see what God can do through his body of believers in this world. Amen. With that, let's begin applying it to us. Verse 22 begins. He says, bond servants or employees, obey in all things your masters or employers, according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in sincerity of heart, fearing God. And whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that from the Lord, you will receive the reward of the inheritance for you serve the Lord Christ but he who does wrong will be repaid for what he has done. And there is no partiality. And you can see how this is very applicable to us in the workforce. And it comes very challenging, the living out of the transformed life at work, that we are to represent Christ, not just at church or at home, but at work as well. We as Christians should be the best employees the world ever sees. Our dedication and work ethic should reflect our commitment to Jesus because as we read, we are to be doing it not just for our boss to make a profit, not to only provide for our families, which is huge, but also because God calls us to it. And when we are working, we are not serving our bosses, we are actually serving Jesus. And the first thing he tells us to do is to obey our bosses. 
which means that we are to do what is asked of us without complaining, without throwing a fit, or even engaging in the boss bashing slander hour with the other employees. You know, our bosses might not be the most caring and kind people on the planet, but here God has called us to honor and respect them, even if they don't deserve it. You're like, really, all the time? Yes. Of course, we have to note, unless they ask you to do something that is unethical or immoral, you as a Christian are not to do it. And further, you might not be able to stay there because lying or cheating for your boss will not bring honor to God. One huge distinction between the life of the bond servant and us today is that we are free to leave, that we are not forced to be there. And I remember one of my first jobs after college was a recruiting headhunter position. My job was to track down high executives from one company and recruit them, convince them to quit that company and join their competitor. And as I got into it, I'm like, this is pretty cool. I feel like it's like mission impossible ish. (laughs) Well, the problem was not convincing the executives, but actually getting to them through the administrative people answering the phones. So I would call, it would, it would be like this. If I was to call them the general number, what was I going to say? Hi, can I talk to a high position person in your company? Uh, uh, who are you and what is this regarding? Oh, sorry. My name is Justin Beck and I'm calling from a recruiting firm. I want to take, I want to talk to your, uh, that a high employee and I want to convince him to leave your company and then join this other, your competitor. So can I talk to him? Oh yeah, no problem. Here you go. Let me transfer you right now. No, if I did that, it, I would hear click. So I went and I asked my boss, I said, well, how am I suppo- supposed to get to them? How am I supposed to talk to the secretary and get to this high official? He said, this is what you need to do. Try this. He says, ask the person, or ask for the person, but say, yeah, you know, I was just speaking to them on the phone and I I was talking to their, I had their direct line right on my, on this piece of paper here, but I just can't seem to find it anywhere. Can you just transfer me right back to them? And I thought to myself, so you mean lie? (laughs) And they seemed fine with doing whatever they needed to do to reach that person. And it just did not sit well with me. You know, at that time I was the worship leader here at this church and I honestly felt after that incident that the Lord, he spoke to me graciously but genuinely and said, how can you worship me and praise my name with those lips on Sunday at church but then lie with those same lips Monday morning at work? And I couldn't. So the next day I told them I couldn't lie and I quit. You know, we are to be the best workers we can be, but we cannot compromise our faith. We are to obey our bosses, but we are to obey God over them. And sometimes as Christians, the Lord might ask us to endure a difficult work environment, maybe even face some unfair situations, be passed up on promotions or something like that, but we cannot lie, cheat, or steal for our boss. Even if it is a great paying job with outstanding benefits and awesome perks, we as Christians need to live in a way that is pleasing to the Lord and honors him. The next thing Paul says is, Christian, do not do it for eye service or be a man pleaser. This refers to doing your best only when you're being watched. And how many times does that happen at work? You know, when the boss is around, people are at their best working behavior. They are busy, they are focused, they are productive, hard at work. Even their posture is better when the boss is there. But right when the boss leaves, people totally change gears. Postures change. They grab their phones. They start scrolling through social media. They make personal calls or they start working on personal tasks instead of their jobs. Paul says, don't do that. Be hardworking. Be honest employees all the time. Even if your boss is not watching you, especially if your boss is not watching you because God is watching you. God sees, give him your best, do it unto him. Even if that means you're the only one doing work and the rest of the office gets upset that you don't join in on the idleness. Even if you do do not receive praise and recognition from your boss, do your best because God is watching you. He says, do it with sincerity of heart, fearing God or do it to bring honor to him. 
You know, everything we do while working, whether it is fun or a bummer, dull or exciting, easy or hard, we are to do it with a joyful and pure heart. Whatever the work environment, do your best. And I do sense some of you looking at me with the evil eye. Like, Justin, it's easy for you to say, you are a pastor. Your boss is God. (laughs) Your boss is God too. You might say, well, what do you do? Do you just sit around and read your Bible all the time? Yes, that's exactly what I do all day for work is I just sit and read my Bible. Actually, me and Pastor Andrew, what we do is we just open our Bible, I grab my guitar, we just sing through some songs, we drive by the beach and we just look out at the waves and we just wait for God to speak. That's what we do. It's a little more than that. But in all seriousness, I will admit, even through this tough and divisive, heart-wrenching season with all the uncertainty that we are going through, I am so blessed. I am so grateful that the Lord has called me to this. And I do fear God and I do want to honor him. And I do take this call in my life so seriously. And I try to do my very best for the Lord, for the church. You know, I I try and prepare for Bible studies. It's not like when Jason starts leading worship, I'm I'm, okay, what am I gonna teach today? And just start looking at the passage right there. Or you know, when I have to make tough decisions for what we're going to do as a church body, it it weighs on me and I wanna see God's heart. I wanna honor the call that God has on my life to give my all to him. I wanna hear his heart and I wanna walk in his will as a pastor here. But don't you want to do the same for your life? Don't you want to hear his heart for you and walk in his will? If I can exhort you today, if you are following the Lord, if you are not in sin, but you are living for him, then where you are right now, even regarding your place of work, in this moment is God's will for you. If you are trusting in the Lord, then where you are is where God has called you to be. It may change, it may change quickly, God may open other doors for you. If you hate your job or you don't have peace doing it, he may be moving you on soon. But wherever you are working, do it to your best ability with a sincere sincere heart dedicated to the Lord and trust that the Lord can use you there. He may even change your heart for your job. Maybe you can't stand it now, but if you dedicate yourself to him and serve him as you do it, it might change. You might actually enjoy it. It might be exciting again if you do it unto him. And also know this, as you work hard and you do it for the glory of God, he can make you such an example to those who are around you. You know, to those who would never read the Bible, to those who would never step inside a church or step outside to church. You have such an opportunity to shine brightly to your coworkers, to your boss, to your customers, May they see your good works at work and glorify your father in heaven by what a great employee you are. And I know many of you have been affected big time during all this with the shifts and changes in our nation regarding work, even losing jobs or getting pay cuts. The important thing, if that is you, is to continue to know that God is still with you that he's still there. You are still his child and he promises to supply all your needs according to his riches. Philippians chapter four, verse 19 tells us that. Think about that, according to his riches. Not the riches of this world, but what God can do. God could do exceedingly and abundantly above all that we ask or or think even in this area. Keep trusting him, keep looking to him. Apply to places, send out resumes, do what you need to do, but don't lose hope. Because God, he will come through. You know, we're told by Jesus that if he cares, if God cares enough to feed the birds and clothe flowers, he will take care of us. He was talking about provision. He says in Matthew 6, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added to you. That's what we're to do first. We are to first seek God with our whole hearts and then watch him come through. To trust the Lord, walk with him and he will provide. And when he does and you get that job, whether it's your dream job or not, do it with sincerity of heart. Giving all you got, do it unto Jesus. 
Give your all as an act of service to the Lord. Be honest, hardworking, respectful, loyal, punctual, and reliable. This is how you can honor God and shine brightly to those observing. But look at what else Paul says in verse 23 and 24. He says, and whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance for you serve the Lord Christ. Today, you might have a brutal boss. You might have a difficult work environment. You might not get the promotions or the recognitions that you deserve. People might not notice you at all, but God notices you. He sees your hard work and dedication. He takes notes and he rewards you. He will reward you in heaven. We so often think of rewards only in terms of when we do church ministry type stuff. You know, I may receive a reward when I teach the kids or when I pray for someone or I help someone in need or when I pack up chairs and canopies after service. And believe me, we truly appreciate that. And if your heart is right, when you do it, you will be rewarded for that as well. But that's not the only times. When you are faithful at work, God has a reward for you. And it is different than financial compensation or a retirement plan or the end of the year bonuses you can get from a job. It is a reward straight from your glorious God. And I'm pretty sure any reward he gives will not be disappointing and be a billion times better than any recognition or re reward we can get on this earth. And know that it is awaiting for you in heaven. What an incentive, what a motivation to work hard for the Lord. So do what is right, do it for the Lord and you will be rewarded. But just as we receive acknowledgement from God when we do right, look at what verse 25 says. But he who does wrong will be repaid for what he has done and there is no partiality. God takes notes when we do what is right, but he also takes notes when we do things wrong and we will face consequences. Now we have to understand that Paul is not referring to salvation. Like if we don't do good work as employees, we will lose our salvation. No, that would literally be a works, right? No, our salvation is not based upon that. Our salvation is based upon God's grace and faith in Jesus alone. But the Bible talks about a day where our works and actions will be judged as Christians. Not a making it to heaven kind of thing, but a rewards thing. And is known as the Bema Seat of Christ. And there we will either be rewarded for the works we have done in the Lord with the motivation of bringing glory to God or we will miss out on the potential rewards Jesus has for us because we did things with the wrong heart or for selfish gain. That those things that were done with the wrong motives, they will not be rewarded. And I don't know about you, but I would prefer to receive whatever God has for me, the rewards from him. And if you do too, seek to honor him every chance you get, whether it's serving him here, whether it's serving him out in the world or whether it's serving him in the workplace. I mean, verse 23 just pops out and whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord. God has called us to work for him, to glorify him. This is for employees. And Paul has one thing to say to, to employers, but it's huge. Verse, uh, chapter four, verse one, masters, give your bond servants what is just and fair, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. Paul is saying, you masters, who are in the place of authority over another, you do not have the final say. You might be the big boss, but there is an even bigger boss who you will answer to, not for your ethical, only for your ethical business practices, but also how you treat the ones you have authority over. Your master is God in heaven and you will give an account to him. And so if you are one who has authority, who is a boss, you are instructed to be just and fair to do what is right. Don't overwork your employees. Don't shortchange them. Don't treat them unkindly. Don't wrong them in any way. Do what is right. You know, as the employee is pouring their life and honoring God by their hard work ethic and commitment to you and the company, you are to be committed to them. You know, just like there have been so many heartbreaking stories about people losing jobs, and trying to, to find some kind of work during all that's taking place. There's also so many sad stories about businesses that are suffering and suffering through all of this. And I think we need to pray like even generally for our nation and, and for what these, these businesses that have gone under, 
that God would, would be with them, that God would comfort them, that God would take care of them. He will, but even that they would be led to him. But one thing I'm absolutely, I love to hear, and I've heard it a few times through all that's taking place, even through the hardships and the loss of businesses, is when there are specific business owners who care so deeply for their employees that they're willing to do whatever they can to help them, to keep them working, to support their families. You know, when the business is, is not just about endless profit, but love and care for the people who are part of it. You know, when the owner of the business does not see the worker as a, a soulless figure who is there just to do a task, but they consider them a real part of the company and, and they look at them like they are family. And for me, again, this is such a picture of the body of Christ. You know, the King James Version translates the word fair as equal. You know, Christianity is the great equalizer. What Jesus has done is the most wonderful thing on the planet. He died for every single one of us and no one is better than another. Every person has the same answer, the same access, the same purpose in life. And that purpose is Jesus. And Jesus, he unites us all together in him and he calls us to be family. He calls us to be true brothers and sisters with God as our father and us siblings together. And can I be totally honest with you guys today? <laughs> Before I taught this, this week, I dreaded this section. I, I honestly, I, I dreaded all week long. I was thinking, what if I say the wrong thing? What if I go too far this way? What if I go too far that way? You know, especially, you know, talking about slavery, especially with the cultural tensions we are facing right now. And I struggled all week long and, and I was like, I, I don't know, I, I don't know. And then Friday night, I just felt like the Lord, he changed my view completely. He changed my approach, he changed my mindset and he helped me to realize, he, he said, I just, I felt like I get to talk about you. Lord, in the midst of everything that's going on, I get to talk about the greatest savior, the only savior in this world. And his heart for people, his heart for people, and not about the ugly institutions that have tainted our world. There are, there are many man-made institutions that have completely made this world the ugly place it is today. But God established the one beautiful institution that is not man-made. It is God-made and it's the church. And his church, as his church, as his people, he has called us out of darkness. He has called us out of hate. He has called us out of the wickedness of this world and he's joined us together as family. And he makes us all equal in him. We have to read it. Colossians 3.11, we read it a few weeks ago, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised nor uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave nor free, but Christ is all and in all. Galatians 3.28, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Your history, your past mistakes, your background, your experience does not discount you from joining in. We are one in him. This is what Christ does and this is what should be reflected in the church. You know, this world has and will continue to have a man-made hierarchy. It's a fallen world. These people are better because they are smarter and have a better education. They have more letters after their name, PhD, MD. These people are better because they make this much money. They have this position. They've accomplished this. These people are better because they are from here, not from there. These people are better because they look like this, not like that. That's the way of this world, but that is, we are not of this world. We are of a different world. We have Christ and he, and he unites us. And being of this different world does not mean we have to wait until we are in that place of heaven, in our new world. We are citizens, citizens of that world now. 
and we are to act like it. We are to be the church. Yes, we look different. Yes, we have different experiences, but may that not divide us. May it deepen us. May it deepen us as a body of believers. May, we belong to him. We belong to one another. And may we all learn to be there for one another. You know, I, I love the church. I love the church. I love this church in particular. And I pray that through all the differences, through all the debates, through all the chaos and the noise, we as Christ's followers will stay centered on Jesus. That we will stay centered on his word and we will be what he has called us to be. You know, there's no, no one greater than Jesus. And each one of us who believe in him belong to him. And we belong to one another. It's challenging, it's sobering, but I believe it's so necessary to know that, amen? Hey, okay, Lord, we just thank you so much for your love. We thank you for what you can do. I, I pray that you would bring healing, that you would bring perspective, and you would help us to be what you have called us to be. I pray, God, that those who are heavy, Lord, those who are, Lord, broken, those who are just facing hard times, Lord, with so much going on right now, that you would become everything, that you would be everything to this church, that you would be everything to each individual person of this church. And we would know that you're with us through all that we're facing every step of the way. Lord, I pray for those who are struggling, Lord, as we did apply it to work, Lord, that, they, that those who are in a job that's hard, that you would, if you want them there, if it's your will for them to stay there, that you would bring them the right perspective. Help them to even know that they're doing it unto you. Even if every day is exhausting, may they know that they are doing it for you and that there's a reward waiting for them in eternity. I pray also, Lord, for those who are looking for work, who, do, who those who have lost jobs, who are, are not in a place, Lord, who are even frustrated, Lord, that they can't be uh, working, Lord, that I, I pray that, that they would just cling to you, that they would seek first you and know that you will take care of them. You will take care of them even supernaturally at times. I pray for that, Lord, and I pray, God, that you would make us one as a church, or that you would help us to truly be those who care, those who listen, those who bear burdens with and truly love one another as Christ loved the church, Lord, as Christ gave himself, demonstrated his own love while we were still sinners, Christ died for us to give us life. And we have life in you. We have eternal life and we, we thank you so much. Do a work in our hearts. May we rejoice knowing you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Our Lord is good. Will you please stand? Let's, let's sing praises to the Lord again. I, there's gonna be donuts somewhere, so in the back. Stay around and fellowship a little bit. Let's be the body. God bless you.